Welcome to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere with your host, Chris Parker. Hello, this is Chris Parker back with Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere. Kirk and I worked in 2018 on a data science and data privacy company called Pretty Good Knowledge. Uh, before that, he has an incredible career in the, in the military and in the intelligence community. Wonderful to see you again. And would you please tell people who, who is Kirk Wiebe and, and what, does, what, what do you do and really interested in why do you do what you do? Well, my name is Kirk Wiebe. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Raised in uh, northern Indiana on the shores of Lake Michigan. Mm. Graduated high school and was not ready to go to college. Co college was an ideal I hoped to achieve, but I wasn't ready out of high school. So I joined the United States military, United States Air Force. And this is kind of a pivotal experience for me because it leads to uh, career opportunities that come later. And that is the Air Force sent me to Indiana University to learn Russian language. Why? To make me a spy, hmm. uh, an electronic spy, somebody to, to uh, surf the uh, radio frequency spectrum, look for signals of interest, intercept them, and then translate them if they were voice signals, which most of them were. Um, so in the Air Force, I spent two uh, tours of duty, all in foreign, uh, both in foreign locations, one in Turkey, one in Japan. Loved it, enjoyed it as a young man, the exposure to the culture, the le different languages and so forth. It was just terrific. But I did understand after four years that I needed to get on and make a decision what I was going to do next. So I applied to officers training school. The Air Force said, we want navigators. And I didn't want to be a navigator telling an airplane how to go from point A to point B. That sounded kind of boring. Mm -hmm. So I said, I want to stay intelligence. And they said, no, you can't do that. So I said, OK, thank you. But no, thanks. I'm going back to college. So I returned to Indiana University. Uh, long story short, got a B.A. in 69 and a master's in 72. Applied to the National Security Agency because I knew they were the head of all U.S. Intelli electronic intelligence. And they said, when can you begin? And I said, now, and uh, began a, uh, a more than 32-year uh, career with uh, in that career field with National Security Agency and then some subsequent work uh, with other government agencies solving big problems that were high priority, mm. usually for Department of Defense. Can you tell so, us some top secret stuff right now? Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, my uh, non-disclosure yeah. agreement with the government is continuous. <laughs> well, I, that's something that, I, that I've enjoyed because while working with you and, and, and Bill, Benny, and, and meeting some of your other colleagues from that time, that, that when we start getting near something that might be sensitive, well, that is that little grin that comes on your face that, okay, these guys aren't going to talk anymore. And uh, I'm always curious what's behind the, the grin. But, um, but even, even um, go, moving forward through your time with the, uh, the National Security Agency, and there is a movie about this, um, A Good American, you know, amongst others, um, that sort of outline the hows and whats, but after that, that career and loyalty to the U.S. government, um, can you just give us an, a very briefly what happened, I think around 2001, 2002, why, why you decided to walk away and um, pursue yeah. a different path? Yeah, this is important. Um, it's an important life event, probably the biggest life event in my life, I think. Um, we discovered in 2000, right after 9-11, which should never have happened, by the way. It should never have gone undetected by the National Security Agency or the intelligence community. It's a shame that will forever live on the reputation of the uh, intelligence uh, community. Um, but we discovered that the powers that be began to turn the weapons of surveillance against the American people. Now, imagine this. The US is 
sucker punched by foreign nations. Um, uh, Muslim terrorists, if you will. And we begin to spy on Americans. Um, is that congruent? Uh, no, it doesn't seem to make sense. And so I, I do believe there was another agenda here. Never let a good crisis go to waste to attain mm -hmm. ever more power to get into the lives of uh, individuals. And uh, that's what's happened. Well, when Bill Binney and I and uh, Diane Rourke of the U.S. Congress and Ed Loomis, fellow uh, colleague from NSA, found this out, uh, we, the three of us at NSA, walked out, basically uh, handed in our badges and said, we can't, we can't support this. Mm -hmm. It's against the very Constitution that we swore allegiance to protect against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so we walked out of the building, and for a while we were wondering, what can we do to get this story out? And um, when, when you've been exposed to secrets all your life, and this was also treated as a secret, it's very hard to bring yourself um, to defy that agreement. And, and, but we were finally advised by a lawyer, a constitutional lawyer, that the best way to go was to make the story public. The more you withhold it and try to work under the radar, the easier it is for the government to succeed in shutting you up. Mm -hmm. So we ultimately did go public with it and blew the whistle on NSA. And um, the thank you we got for that was a raid by the FBI in 2007 that appeared at each of our houses, about a dozen agents at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time on 26 July 2007. And they proceeded to enter our homes, uh, go through everything, grab computers, anything that had a, 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 a memory, everything from digital memory to notes, and take it away. Well, long story short, we ended up suing them for taking our equipment. We had done nothing wrong. And we ended up winning that in court without a lawyer using our own expertise to counter the- Which is, the, which uh, is already incredible, so. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's, um, thank God for that. But it and, was a shock. Yeah, and then roll forward, that was 2007, um, roll forward like, there, and there's a lot that happened in between, but let's roll forward 10 plus years and with pretty good knowledge here in Europe, um, that was a uh, initiative funded by a, a corporate sponsor and there was was top talent you bill um some great data scientists and engineers and, and um you know data security hack hacker type people commercial people and the, and the premise of that was to enable organizations government or private to engage in large-scale analytics while respecting the law and while respecting the you know the human right of privacy, and basically doing things in a bit of a more of a, a wise way, as opposed to simply grab it all and and do and, and unleash you know unfettered power. Can you can you talk a little bit about what what was your motivation for? Basically, you were flying to Europe every other month, working with insurance companies and banks, and you know part of the Dutch government. Um, you should be retired. Why were why are why are you so yeah, passionate you know, still yeah. about these topics? It is um, a great question for this reason. Um, although we attempted to blow the whistle on the wrongs being done by the U.S. government's uh, intelligence community in surveilling Americans um, and innocent people all over the world, uh, not just Americans. Um, it ran against our DNA. As I said, we were sworn to uphold uh, the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which says that a person should be secure in their personal effects and communications and things. And so this was a matter of principle. This wasn't just a business proposition. This was what that had some dollar value that we were willing to be bought off. No, it was a principle we were raised with, swore to, and to this day, 
No one's relieved us of our oath to uphold that constitution with that right of privacy. And uh, we just believe it ought to be for uh, the world, not just Americans. And uh, so we promised ourselves to stay in the fight. So when we got the opportunity to work uh, uh, in terms of um, form the business of PGK, that principle uh, drove a lot of our behavior. Why did we go to Europe? Well, Europe's, we saw, was easier. It was a more friendly to, to Bill and me. Uh, we, we didn't have natural enemies in Europe. Most Europeans viewed us as um, good people. Well, well plus had, GDPR had, well, not far before that just happened. And so, you know, the European governments and institutions were leaning into privacy as opposed to, you know, trying to find ways to defeat it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and you have to understand that Bill and I knew that it was eminently possible, eminently doable, not just possible, doable to surveil the world and not violate the rights of innocent people. Throughout the ages, law enforcement people have focused on people who are either bad or suspected of being bad. Mm -hmm. You should not include that to mean innocent people. Why would you do that? You end up wasting your time. So from a practical business approach, it's stupid to surveil a bunch of innocent people and spend that time and money. So we knew how you could recognize probable cause, an essential principle under our constitution that enables a court, if you demonstrate probable cause, to reveal the identity of a person and their papers to law enforcement people. So we wanted to apply that in data we, we knew how to do that. It does not stop you from doing good analysis. In fact, it improves analysis because you tend to focus on real bad people and, and, and probable bad. People. And what I liked about the approach, and again, I, I in, in, in a way studied, you know, the thinking in your approach to data for, for well over a year and we applied it to different cases and projects. I'm still deeply saddened that we are not able to productize it and, and find something scalable, but what we also weren't able to find a lot of organizations that had the data maturity um, and the data availability to, to actually really put this to use, but that's happening more and more every day. So currently I'm working, as I shared with you, with a, uh, um, a Dutch bank using some of these these principles and architectures in order to improve their data capabilities because it's, it, it's completely trans, transferable. But, but since PGK, you are, you, Again, I have not gone to the golf course. You're still going for it. You, you, um, two things that I know of you're working on. One, one is you occasionally uh, present and speak at universities about ethics and data. I'm curious about that. And also you're, you're um, working with, um, at least in discussions with a couple of states about voter fraud. So what, what's, what are you busy with right now? Um, still doing ethics and still mm -hmm. looking at opportunities to help identify voter fraud. The frustrating thing is, whether it's ethics or voter fraud, it is hard to find a clear path forward, either for political reasons or managers that don't quite understand the role of ethics. Indeed, in many schools, ethics is either not taught or it's an elective. Hmm. It's not mandatory. And, and, and my way of thinking, it should be mandatory. Here's why. Anything in life requires you to make judgments about what you're going to do. And, and um, what you choose to do begins to define you and your character. You can choose a life of crime, a life of deceit. I don't care, big scale, you can do small stuff. You can be a pickpocket or you can go rob banks. You can even murder people. Or you can choose a life that's respectful of others at least initially, until people prove you wrong, that they themselves are bad, and then you make a choice not to affiliate with them. So we, we make cho choices in life. 
and uh, it defines us on what we want to be. And we can we can make conscious decisions about what we want to be. So it's it's um, within our own sphere of influence to make those decisions. Now, ethics, frankly, is at its most basic level. Uh, um, a definition of what is right and what is wrong. What's happened, however, in society, and I think even globally with diversity and, and the mixing of cultures and, and folkways and mores from all over the place, it's less clear about what's permissible and not permissible in the workplace. So the proper application, the appropriate application is for businesses to define ethical behavior. Mm -hmm. What's their do not do list? Do not do this, do not do that. And if I were an employee or someone looking for a job, I would want to hear from that business that I'm talking to what their code of ethics is have they even thought about it? If they don't so, have a list, that tells you a lot. Well, Kirk, um, just to challenge a little bit, and I love challenging you. Um, sure. Isn't it so obvious? Is, isn't it almost an insult if a company does have have a code of ethics? Shouldn't shouldn't we just know that? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, what we find out is that there are some mm. cultures that will uh, tolerate a certain amount of what mm. we would consider to be unethical, maybe even petty larceny. Mm -hmm. Well, I needed a dollar, I needed two dollars, so I borrowed it from the coffee fund for two weeks, but I did mean to pay it back when I got my paycheck. So now the coffee fund becomes a bank. And mm. that's, not because, that's not ethical yeah. in, in the classic sense. Uh, but may be viewed by others as no harm in it. And, uh, yeah, unless you agree that it is ethical and you uh, that's perhaps right. write it down. So then it's, and, uh, that's, yeah. and that's the point. The idea is to challenge the organization to have this discussion so that everybody's on the same page. Because if it's unwritten, the ethics can be made up by whoever controls the organization. And has right. And that's not fair to the employees. So we really need to be so, fair in two directions. Let's let's connect the ethics, Kirk, to voting. Yeah. And some somehow, and I've heard a lot about you about voting, voting mechanisms, processes, systems. So I'm wondering if there's anyone who's more of an expert these days than you are after your research recently. But um, if if what I heard from you is true, the, the ethics manual of uh, the voting system in the states would be rather thin. Yes. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, it would be. Uh, and, and it makes no difference whether you view the process at a high level or you look at the uh, systems administration supporting those voting mm -hmm. systems, which are essentially computer based, Windows. Uh, Microsoft-based systems. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it sounds simple. I mean, we vote and we count the vote. And we report the vote. But unfortunately, um, there are glitches. There are things that go wrong, especially in data transfer when it's manual from a, a, a disk to another component in the process. And there's also room for playing with the vote, especially when the disk goes missing for four days and then shows up suddenly where was it for that four days so yeah custody chain of custody all of this is critical so as more voting fraud is uncovered and it is being uncovered um there's more concern about what are we going to do now the voting in the united states is controlled by the 50 states and not in unison they each Mm. can buy whatever voting apparatus and system they want to. Mm. There's three major vendors that basically have a chokehold on the marketplace. And they often sit on many oversight committees. So you've got the fox uh, watching the hen. You know, it's unbelievable. So lots of room for disorder, uh, corruption, playing around, especially in voter registration roles as well. So Bill Benny and I sat down and as we learned about this and, and confirmed that there is a problem, 
And there have been major reports that I can quote for people published by third parties that verify that the, mm. these systems aren't even properly maintained. Windows XP is still out there. I mean, mm. you know, Microsoft stopped support quite a while ago. So anyway, um, it's the politics of it. Some people are happy with this loosey-goosey mm. system. Other people don't know what to do. It's a second thought. These um, machines and, and voting process is not well funded by the states. So the federal government often has to bail out the states with extra funds. But the federal government has no role in regulating it. So we've got 50 entities all doing it slightly different. Nobody's <clears throat> particularly healthy, some doing it better than others. And so we are considering developing a way to replace the existing process with something much simpler, much more secure, mm -hmm. tamper-proof, verifiable. Uh, but that will be in the future. That will be in the future. So if there's someone who's involved, even internationally, with voting systems, voting security, it's almost, it even comes down to societal trust. Yes. You know, you know so because if, if we as citizens in any country, I think, are, don't have that trust of the transaction of the vote then then why vote you know because because it's already it's your, it's your only chance to voice your opinion mm -hmm. yeah and it should be sacrosanct it really should be and so um without going into the design of the solution um imagine a head of voting of a european nation state called and said we want to secure our voting. Um, is that going to be like five to 10 billion in investments or something else? No, I, I, I think the initial part is to get it designed. Yeah. Um, so the cost, I think, is up front in the design. But once you design it, the, the replication and deployment is pretty pretty easy to do. Yeah. So it should be low cost. It should not be high cost. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's, yeah. that's where I've always been impressed with what you guys do is, is and, and maybe, you know, maybe that's where we went wrong with PGK a little bit is we weren't trying to sell software for high, you know, software sales. It was like, well, actually we can do this pretty easily. And it almost became disinteresting because it wasn't a big enough of a budget hit to, you know. So I, my suggestion to you is, Kirk, based on our experience, take whatever the price is, times it by 10. And, yeah, and people will buy it. So it's funny you say that because I had a guy with a lot of experience at the Pentagon say to me, "Whatever you think is the honest figure, multiply it times five. Yeah, same yeah. same sort of idea. So, Kirk, you have been um, a bit anti-establishments, you know, for quite some time, and and even raided by the FBI unjustly. Um, how do you keep going? You know, you and I have had some time at the gym here in Amsterdam, you know, with a trainer, um, you know, keeping our bodies, you know, in shape a bit. I miss those times. Uh, we've also had hamburgers and other things to balance that out of, uh, you know, but but how you you as a person, as a human, and, and this is a question for any, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, you know, someone who's, you know, pushing that boulder uphill. How do you keep going? What's what is your uh, trick of keeping your energy flowing? I, um, part of it's my nature. I, 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 I can't sit idly and do nothing. And I can't just play solitaire. Mm -hmm. There's no reward in that. And so I have to be immersed in some, something. It doesn't have to always be noble, but it should be something hard and worth doing. Mm -hmm. And it's not always financial. It's more about principle and achieving, mm -hmm. and it's very centered on on mankind and doing something worthy and leaving yeah. something behind. So that's what keeps me young. It keeps me going. And even though I know the next 10 chances may fall through, yeah. you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, know, you, you got to keep knocking on the door. So Just keep knocking on the door. That's right. Yeah. And one of my um, last questions, and I'm really, really curious what your answer is to this, is, is in, your, in your entire life, in your entire career, 
What is something that has helped you simplify your life the most? Gee, um, in terms of an enabler, I, I wouldn't say it simplified, simplified my life, but, but it certainly helped me down the road. And that would be becoming a um, ham radio operator. Mm. When I was very young, at age 11, um, I passed my first uh, exam and was licensed to uh, talk internationally anywhere in the world with other hobbyist ham mm. radio operators. The reason I say this was important, because by the time I entered the military after graduating from high school, some seven years had gone by. So I had seven years of radio frequency experience, communications experience, the concepts, the concept of uh, radio wave propagation in the atmosphere and the physics of all of that and the 11 year sunspot cycle and how that affects uh, radio waves, et cetera. That became golden when I joined uh, the National Security Agency because of course, they're all about communications. And when I first went there, there was no internet. Yeah. There was no IP. Yeah. Uh, none of that. There was no TCP IP. So um, radio waves was everything and switched, cir uh, switch circuits, not packet switch circuits. Uh, so um, it helped me in my career immensely to have that background. Well, I guess it was following your passion. Yeah. Even exactly. from then. So... Marvel. So, so Kirk, in, in summary, um, I would personally love to work on a project with you and Bill and the others, you know, with an organization that wants to do large scale analytics in a very wise and respectful way. So I would invite anyone who's, who's uh, listening to this that, that, that says, hey, we want to do big things with data in a um, very simplified, that doesn't mean easy, but a very simplified and efficient way that respects the law and privacy. Um, you're also busy with um, voter fraud. So anyone who's, who's busy in that, because I would love, because I, I also, you know, knowing you guys, it will not be expensive to, to develop this and, and then deploy this. Uh, you know, it's the politics that comes into play. And um, I know one of your passions is actually, you know, speaking about this, these choices in life, which are around ethics. So Chris, there's one more uh, market there's one more marketplace where we could help people. If anyone is in possession of a data lake mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do with it, we can help them decide mm -hmm. very easily where it fits their business, where it can be valuable to make them smarter, better, more efficient. Kirk, thank you so much. Great. It's been delightful seeing you again. The pleasure is all mine. Learn more at ebillion.com slash podcast.